dear friends, dear partners, dear guests, we welcome you to the sixth edition of the Zermatt Summit. This is a special moment for me and for those who were never here before. I would like to explain a little bit what Zermatt Summit stands for, what are our values, what, are, what is the spirit behind Zermatt Summit. So uh, we have, since 2010, we were proud to have engaged over 1,000 speakers and participants from 45 countries. So we have an international mission. But what are these values? First of all, the respect for the human person and for nature, of course, for life. We want to, uh, behind the values are, is the Catholic social teaching, but of course these values are universal. Uh, we want to engage uh, leaders. Also, we want everyone here to engage and this is not a bottom-down, but more a horizontal or a bottom-up exercise where everybody can be a change-maker, everybody can make a difference. Behind the Zermatt Summit are also some concepts you see in, in our documentation and everywhere we talk about the dignity of the human person because we think this is absolutely fundamental, the responsibility of each of us. We talk about the common good. For those who don't know what that is, that means really uh, allowing every, the, the conditions that uh, individuals and a group all together can be fulfilled. We talk about servant leadership, which is not serving yourself as the leader of an organization, but actually serving the organization. And those are some of the values we have defended over the years. Now to come to this year's theme on innovation. Innovation comes from the Latin innovare, to, re to renew, to transform. The creative dimension is a key element of human action, especially in the economic and business fields where innovation and entrepreneurial capacities are essential. I will focus more on the economic aspects of innovation, two main dimensions being the degree of novelty and the type of innovation. But I will also focus on the need for a new vision. As you know, previous industrial revolutions liberated humankind from animal power, made mass production possible and brought digital capabilities to billions. So we moved from the first industrial revolution by Johannes Gutenberg to the second discovery of the steam engine. The third was the personal computer and internet. And now some say we're on the fourth industrial revolution, which seems to be different. It is characterized by a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries, and even challenging ideas about, about what it means to be human. The resulting shifts and disruptions that we live in a time of, is, a, is, is a time of great promise, but also a time of great peril. We will, confront, we will focus on this meeting on the positive side, but we'll also raise some of the risks the world has the potential to connect billions more people to digital networks, dramatically improving efficiency of organizations and even managing assets in a way that can help regenerate the natural environment, potentially undoing the damages from previous industrial revolutions. So we believe all forms of innovations, not only technology, can be highly beneficial in improving living conditions, enhance, enhancing human life but we should be aware of the risks inherent in their implementations. Together, we shall explore innovative economic and business models based on better access to things easily shared. So please come on time tomorrow at 8.30 to listen to uh, Dr. Gunther Pauli, who is a real expert, worldwide expert in this field, and who will start and open the conference. This is very, very uh, enlightening and inspiring. So these new models of development are due to different factors in society. Recession, or let's say low growth, or no growth in the economy, pushing us to rethink the relationship between each other, providing meaning, I think people are looking for meaning, purpose, the population growth, which means we're living more in cities, climate change, and the distrust of authority, including big brands. You saw the some of the recent unethical behaviors of large companies uh, in the press.
But the real revolution is the human heart. Like my father, uh, like my friend, Father Nicholas would say, the revolution from mind to heart. And innovation starts with leadership and human ingenuosity. Ingen ingenuosity. It begins when we allow ourselves to think the different kind of economy might be possible. The real world always departs from ideals. So it's time to dream a deeper dream where a regenerative economy is built around ideals such as fairness, community, sustainability, benefit, benefiting the many rather than the few, enabling the human person and the living planet to flourish. Some leaders and companies have already made this shift like the organizations they lead. You will hear them during the coming days. They are not interested in maximizing financial wealth only. They know it's possible to have plenty and recognize that enough is enough. They value other things more highly, like being happy, living authentically, feeling alive, living well in community, leaving the world a better place. My company is in the surface engineering field, is a certified B Corp. B Lab is behind this movement of certification, uh, which now represents about 2,400 companies worldwide, of which 30 in Switzerland, and that have really integrated in their core strategy and business sustainable development, not only in strategy, but also in operations. But where are the risks? According to Mr. Ray Kurzweil, Director of Engineering of Google, the sky is the limit. We have an infinite economy, uh, economic horizon. Singularity will be equal and bypass the subtlety and refinement of what we consider the best human attributes. He predicts that non-biological -biolog intelligence will bypass intellectual capacity of all humans in the next few years. Machines will be human even if they are not biological. So, if intelligence is the abil ability to solve problems and consciousness is the ability to feel things in order to decide what is good or bad, both are closely connected in human beings. The question becomes then what is more valuable, the intelligence of algorithms or the human consciousness? So that is one risk, is that we are creating robots with high intelligence but no consciousness. Another aspect which is new, which is new and overwhelming is the acceleration of innovation when the pace of innovation exceeds the pace of integration. For the first time in history, we are unable to know what basic life will be like in 50 years' time. We are saturated with data, but have lost the ability to predict. We have no meaningful vision for creating a better future, except for that of a few Silicon Valley gurus and entrepreneurs. So we risk bypassing the human person and the common good and creating a state of inner fear, stress, and inadequacy. So we believe we need to reach a state of interior silence and peace, which can allow unification and thought integration. The human person has to find the tempo giusto, as the Italians would say. We need to rediscover a time that allows a space for grace and gift. Our first speaker, Thomas Sedlacek, will develop this aspect, I believe, during his presentation. This is why we at the Zermatt Summit Foundation take into account all aspects of anthropology. The human person is the system of reference from which innovation can develop and not the contrary. Our raison d'etre is to be a place of dialogue and reflection where ethical and social impact can be assessed by placing the human person and the common good at the center of our decisions. We believe this dialogue between business leaders, academia, civil society, public sector, liberal arts, social science scholars, spiritual leaders, will contribute to bring solutions of hope and purpose to the world. I welcome to this edition all our distinguished speakers who will contribute to innovation, going from ideas to action in order to build a better world. To name just a few, Dr. Gunther Pauli, the founder of Zeri and author of The Blue Economy, Thomas Sedlacek, economist, author of The Economy of Good and Evil, 
Navi had your author of Frugal Innovation, Gilles Babinet, first president of the French Digital Council, entrepreneur and author, Gilbert Delmarmol, author, lecturer on the subject of positive economy, but also entrepreneurs such as Chido Govero from Zimbabwe, Kelvin Doe from Sierra Leone, Jean-Michel Keguiné, Alexandre Gérard from France, business leaders from Singapore, Frédéric Tsao from Morocco, Isham El Habti, Carlos Morea from Switzerland, Elizabeth Moreno, Arno Ganglo from France, managers and experts from leading companies in the digital field, Dr. Ukanova from Google, Dr. Michael Bezville from Swisscom, and Jean-Philippe Debiol from IBM. Not to mention master hacker, Andy Müller-Magen from the uh, famous Chaos Computer uh, Circle, sorry, club, thank you. University Dean Pierre Georgini, lawyers, uh, Alain Bessoussan, Sébastien Fanti, specialized in advanced technologies, scientist, Professor Laurence de Villiers, and Father Eric Salobir of Optic Networks, and Father Nicolas Butet, member of the board. And finally, philosopher Bertrand Vergely, and pianist Elizabeth Sombart, head of the Resonance Foundation, since culture and arts make the beauty of economy. I want to thank our moderators, Jean Stone. Jean, please come up so they, they, they meet you, who is our program director. <laughs> Professor Guido Palazzo of HSC. Where is Guido? He's there. Please stand up, Guido, so we see you who is helping us, thank you, and Emmanuel Dancourt, who is a journalist and TV presenter. And they will help us uh, um, moderate the round tables. I also want to thank wholeheartedly all our generous sponsors and partners, the Lund Foundation, the OCP Group from Morocco, the Loterie Romande, Swisscom, Kia Partners, any NL International, Lenovo, the municipality of Zermatt, the Family Business uh, International Foundation, B Lab Switzerland, Coninco, Serra, Bebuda, Vecma, Fondation Resonance, Turning Point, and TLS Surface Engineering. Our success will ultimately, ultimately be determined by the degree to which minds and hearts will be touched and actions are taken as a result. Yes. This is perhaps the biggest risk. You must have the courage to think and act in a different way. I think Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible till it's done. I wish you an inspiring two days journey. May this only be the beginning. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope I've not been too long. So now I'd like to introduce Thomas Sedlacek. Thomas Sedlacek is from the Czech Republic, so he came all the way. Czech, Czech. Yes, it sounds, it sounds familiar. I think you have been close to Vaclav Havel, who is a humanist, politician, a very famous man. And you're an economist, you're a lecturer. I call you the rock and roll economist because you speak of instead of you don't speak only of mathematics like many uh, Nobel prizes in economics but of the human person so welcome to this floor the floor is yours oh and let me say one one last thing please thomas come come up um, there will be time for questions tomorrow during the workshop so please keep your questions for tomorrow otherwise we finish at midnight tonight because i'm sure you have a lot of questions so we have specially designed workshops where for all speakers, all keynote speakers, there will be a question and answer session, not only five or 10 minutes like it is usually here, but for one hour, correct? So keep your questions for tomorrow. Um, one last announcement, then I give you the floor. Um, tomorrow we start at 8.30, and uh, for those who are interested, there's a Catholic mass at the main church in uh, Zermatt at seven o'clock. From 7 to 7.30, where is Father Nicholas? With Father Nicolas Butet. And this will be tomorrow and also on Sunday. <laughs> Thomas, please, Thank you, you don't have to stand behind. You can also move here as you wish. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's easy to uh, wait. 
Yeah, okay. Well, it's easy to remember. I'm Sadler Czech and I come from Czech. So one way to, to surprisingly shorten these things. So it's a great pleasure to be here with you. And uh, my attempt today is to combine the unexpected. So I'm going to combine, combine the oldest business cycle in the history of mankind with the newest and also try to connect what you spoke about, the digitalization and artificial intelligence. And if you like, read the Genesis story into it, because when God was creating us, he was always also thinking that he's creating artificial intelligence. I mean, to divinity, we must look like artificial intelligence. But let's take it, let's take it um, step by step. The first ever economic discourse happened around the oldest ever business cycle in the history of mankind. Now, which one was it? It's not 10 yet, so you still have to... Yeah, sorry. I give you a reduction if you do a little bit of the thinking. Huh? So, uh, what was the first business cycle in the history of mankind? And you all know the story. Old Testament, good. Warmer. Okay, we got Old Testament. We got agriculture, yeah. There was some idea around here, maybe, no? Selling apples, that, that's <laughs> printing. Printing, way before printing, yeah. Shabbat, a little bit after Shabbat, but close. It was really literally good years followed by bad years, followed by good years, by bad years, like a business cycle today. S Somebody said cows? Cows, yes. Come, come, we got it, we got it. I don't, I don't remember the story exactly. But she said cows. You said cows? Seven, seven, yes, the seven years of... Uh, the seven years of famine and the seven... Perfect, good. S we already have it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's the bigot? It's Genesis 42. First book of Moses. <laughs> And you all got it right. So, so this is actually the oldest ever business cycle in the history of mankind. It comes from a religious text. And uh, to be honest, it's the best description of the business cycle that I've ever heard of. So you all know the story. Pharaoh has a dream. You correct me, uh, father. <laughs> father is texting away. You are spiritually elsewhere, which is what we should be. <laughs> This is, I think, the hallmark of Christianity, being spiritually elsewhere. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Pharaoh has a dream, okay? He dreams about seven fat cows and seven lean cows. If you don't believe me, you can open up your Bible. First book of Moses, chapter 41 to 42. 42 is a good number. Those of you who know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah, there we go. 42 is the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. And I think in economics, most of the numbers that we give are 42s in disguise. So an inflation number is usually 2.4 or 4.2. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really knows what it means, but, but let's go back to, to Genesis. So it's Genesis 42. <clears throat> Pharaoh doesn't know what it means, so he calls prophets and they all blah, 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 until Joseph, who was a Hebrew prophet, uh, comes and tells him, this is a little bit of a, of a paraph paraphrasis, it's not exactly like this in the Bible, but pretty much. So uh, Joseph comes to Pharaoh and he says, congratulations, Pharaoh, you just had the first macroeconomic prediction 14 years ahead of you. This has never happened in mankind. These days, we economists are usually two years ahead wrong. <laughs> they were 14 years ahead right. And Pharaoh says, okay, this is the German question. I understand here in Switzerland, we can switch between languages. It's always, yeah, it's always the Germans or the Canadians. Uh, and, and Pharaoh asks him, was soll man 
Yeah, this is the Kantian question. Immanuel Kant had three questions. What should I know? What can I know? What can I believe? Und was soll man tun? Was soll man tun? What shall one do? Is the question of ethics. And this is exactly the question that Pharaoh asks Joseph, says, okay, that's very good to know that it's going to be seven good years and seven bad years, but what should I do? And uh, Joseph says, an interesting story, maybe, you, maybe somebody can remember. What did Joseph say? You have to make a reserve for the seven bad years. For the seven bad years. He said exactly one-fifth, which is 20% by and large. <laughs> and um, during the good years, do not eat everything that grows, but save. Today, this is very difficult for us because we don't even understand the word saving anymore. Uh, saving, well, I remember when I was young, when I was young, my parents used to save for a car. When they were saving for something like a car, it meant I had to not go to movies, no new jeans, no new toys, and very basic food. That's how people look like when they're saving. They could eat more, but they don't. This, of course, has been finally abolished by the modern system of banking, where you don't need to save for anything. You can just get it and you pay back later. What's interesting here is that uh, the, 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 the relevance of Joseph's advice was absolutely Keynesian. Those of you who know John, Stewart, John Maynard Keynes, John Stewart Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, know that that's exactly what he wanted to do. So what he wanted to do, what Joseph wanted to do is don't eat everything you can, take a little bit of the good energy during the good years, take it away, and then put it in the bad years so that you don't die from hunger. So this is basically called, instead of having a cycle like this, you make a cycle like this. And the basic advice there was, baby, slow down. Don't get overexcited. It's okay, it's gonna be bad again. <laughs> so, um, a lot of people, if you read the newspapers, you will find during the crisis period that a lot of analysts, my colleagues, economists, politicians, journalists, and other good people, uh, were trying to look, try to make it look like that the economy is depressed. Now, depression, interesting, depression is not an economic turn, it's a medical turn. It comes from psychiatry or psychology. And uh, in order to say that somebody is depressed, that's a very, very serious illness, by the way. It hits about 33% of the citizens of European Union have to be clinically treated for, for depression. So I'm quite sure you know somebody around you who suffers from this very bad illness. But my basic point here is that this is a misdiagnosis. We don't suffer from depression. We suffer from manic depression. And that's a completely different sickness, although in half of the time it looks the same. And this is something that Joseph, 4,500 years ago, understood without mathematics, without Excel sheets, without universities, without even having any, th any knowledge of economics whatsoever. The, the, the advice was same. It's not depression, it's manic depression. The problem with markets is that when things are good, we over-exaggerate our good mood. And when things are bad, we over-exaggerate our bad mood, going from manias to depressions. Now, my point here, which I'd like to present to you as a thesis, is that manias, the upper going part, are more dangerous than the depressions. Why? For a couple of reasons. First of all, let's establish uh, what do we mean by Mania. So if you look on Wikipedia or if you even go a little bit more um, sophisticated medical definitions, um, a manic person is a person who satisfies by and large four categories. First of all, he or she believes in the future is going to be better and better and better and better and better till no, 
better and better and better till forever. Secondly, he, um, he spends or she spends much more money than they can afford. This is quite typical of people who go through Romania. They order buses in, 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 in dozens. You borrow, you, you spend more money than you can afford. It's a tip, second typical uh, sign of mania. Third, people work much harder and much more effectively and they're even much more creative than an average. So this is exactly the situation we've had here and we are having, my point is, right now, here again. Our civilization is spending much more money than we can afford. Uh, the levels of debt didn't go down vis-a-vis -vis 2009, but they went up a multiple of times. Our society today is much more fragile than it was at the end of 2008. Only it looks better for reasons that I don't think we need to go in today, but I'm happy to do that, of course, tomorrow. So, uh, the only way how you can heal or get energy in the downturns is from here. So just imagine that in your life, you have something that controls your mood. Chocolate, I think, is a good candidate, right? So just imagine that you have portions of chocolate here in your pocket, and if you have bad mood, you can eat a little bit of chocolate, and if you have good mood, you don't touch it. So you save the energy for bad, so that you don't swing up and down, but you sort of terminate it. Our society exhibits all three characteristics of being in mania. Look at the stock exchange, look at pretty much everything we do. It's beautiful, but the point here is that it's unsustainable. You can't do it. Now, point number one. Point number two, I'd like to show that manias are more dangerous than depressions. First, if you have a patient who is going through a manic period, he or she will never admit they're sick. They will never seek the help of a doctor because they feel just about fine. They've never feel, felt better in their lives. It's a person who's depressed who actually goes to search for, for a doctor. So here, and this is, I think, the culmination of, of, of this part of the story, is we have a story which is four and a half thousand years old and we still can't sort of behave according to it. We still believe that the economy can be manic all the time. Uh, if you want to heal an alcoholic, and today we live in, a, uh, in, in gender equal society, so I'm going to use as an alcoholic, she. Just to be fair. I mean, no, yeah, you have to be fair both ways. It's always a man who's the alcoholic, but it, you know, <laughs> it could always be the woman. So, um, she. It's, it's like if she came to the doctor and says, you know, I have a problem, I'm an alcoholic. And the doctor says, why do you think so? And she says, oh, because I have uh, hangovers in the morning. If the doctor focuses and treats her hangovers, will she be a better alcoholic? Or worse alcoholic. Imagine an alcoholic without hangovers. What? Yeah, the problem is when you sober out, <laughs> which eventually happens when you run out of. Well, yeah, but the true, the quality is of course, of course. So, so, but but the main point here is that we are trying to sustain a manic situation of the world. So that's my point. Number one, my, my point number two will connect with the point number three, and um, that's, so in, in, in this first example, I tried to show the oldest business cycle compared to the newest business cycle. Maybe one point more than I would say. In that 4,500 plus minus 1,000 years old story, the people of Egypt went through a very, very, very severe business crisis at which famine was at hand. So if they wouldn't have managed it better, 
people would have died of hunger. This is far, far, far away from what we had. But nevertheless, these people went through a much more serious crisis than we did without a single penny of debt. Pharaoh did not need to borrow any money from nobody. Why? Because he saved before. Now, this is a completely uh, distracting idea. But just imagine that the government of Switzerland, France, Czech Republic, the West, imagine we would enter the crisis with zero debt. Zero debt to GDP ratio. You know that in Europe it's more common to have 70% of debt to GDP, which means that you would have to work 70% of the year without getting paid any single penny just to pay the debt. This means we would all die. If you want to pay a 70% of debt so that you can still eat at least bread and water, it would take, you five, it would take the nation five years to pay back that 70% of GDP. It is no easy money. That means five years, five, six years for all of you on bread and water only, working the jobs you do, but giving every single money, every single penny to correcting the debt. In other words, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Europe, the West is 70% richer than it is. It's, a, it's fake money. It's like I go to a bank and I take a loan of 2 million euros, yeah? And I come to you and I say, who's got more cash? That's absurd because that 2 million euros from bank isn't mine. I can't really compare that with, with anybody. But nevertheless, this is a situation that we have. So uh, uh, Egypt managed to go through a much more severe, much more devastating business cycle, depression, without a single penny of debt. This today to us is completely outside of our even imagination. It never even entered nobody's mind that one way, how to go through crises and not to borrow money from, but actually to spend the money that you have. That's just one example how far we moved away from uh, sort of the economics that every child, child gets. We rediscovered this eventually back with Keynes. So that's my point number one, just to show how ethically twisted our whole thinking about the economy, economy is. Uh, um, I, I think today we're living in a society where um, uh, companies are no longer being so autistic as they used to be. I mean, we, when I was a student uh, at university, they all told us, I, I, I suppose, the same thing, all of those business people here, uh, that the business of business is to do business and that the only God-given task of a, society, of, a, of, of a company is to make profit, period. Uh, it's like an autistic child who cares for itself only. And you can see that this is something that actually leads to regulation at the end of the day. Uh, just imagine a situation. We all agree that there should be sanctions on Russia for invading Ukraine, right? If, so majority of us. You don't agree? Well, this is a different, different okay. This is a different problem. But I believe that Russia should be punished for attacking a free country. We talk about that later. Uh, if you agree, would you do this? Would you sanction Russia without the government imperative? So if the government left it to you, 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 and you, to export to Russia, would you cease exporting to Russia? Now, either business has this responsibility, or it doesn't, or government has it. And because we people of business have been, have been learning this very weird theory of the invisible hand of the market, we believe that we have nothing to do with morals. 
we believe that we are only there to make profit, and the way we make profit is the best way to moralize the society. This is the teaching of the invisible hand of the market. The invisible hand of the market, the key teaching of economics, basically tells you, look for your own good, and by doing that, you are most useful to society. In whatever you do, do not care about the destiny of somebody else. If you care about him, you're destroying the whole game. This is quite interesting because it's a little bit of a parallel to St. Paul. St. Paul said, I want to do good, but uh, 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 I somehow, I don't know how, I end up doing evil, right? The invisible hand, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. I want to do evil, I want to be selfish, I don't care about anybody else, but oh my God, I did it again, sorry, I actually helped the common good. <laughs> this, is, this is the meaning of the invisible hand of the market. It rids you of responsibility, especially of moral responsibility. So <clears throat> to a certain extent, it's understandable, but then again, you're creating a society of, uh, well, I don't know, here in Switzerland, do you know the term Fachidioten? <laughs> Fachidiot? Yeah. Fachidiot is, a, is an expert idiot. A person who understands very well one thing, but he doesn't or she doesn't understand the whole context. And I am afraid that this is the situation in which we are, uh, in which we are finding ourselves. Now, let me in this little bridge, jump to another topic, which I hope will be even crazier. And that is this whole topic that you actually opened, which is digitalization and, um, and, and artificial intelligence. What you see today is, uh, um, in politics, people are trying to fight digitalization, which is a huge challenge, threat, opportunity, topic, a discourse which really could endanger mankind, digitalization. We're trying to find digitalization with nationalism. This is exactly what, for example, Donald Trump is doing. A clever New York taxi driver is afraid of self-driving cars. Stupid New York taxi driver is afraid of Mexican illegal immigrants. That's basically what it is. Uh, cheap labor from the countries such as Czech Republic, Mexico, or Switzerland uh, <laughs> will never really threaten a proper New York taxi driver. He will find his way. Even, uh, even a Swiss taxi driver has to eat. But the true danger here is artificial intelligence. And nobody here has addressed this in a decent way. They say, in international politics, they say that we always fight the wars of the last, we always fight with the weapons of the last war because that's why uh, when trying to get down Saddam Hussein, Americans were trying to use their Vietnam strategies. It's the, no forests there. Only desert, yeah. So today, we are fighting a new enemy, or enemy, new challenge, digitalization, with the old weapons of, of nationalism. Now, let's see, let's see what we can, we can uh, picture in the future. And this, I think, is uh, extremely important because this is where ethics comes in. Please realize that we live in 2017 and we still don't know what to do in a situation where you can either kill one or, let's imagine, self-driving cars, and the self-driving car is in a, di in a dilemma. There is no other alternative except for killing an old lady or 20 young students. We don't know what to do. We have no moral, even Jesus, even I don't know who, nobody gave us good rules how to deal with situations like that, where you have to commit evil, but you try to minimize it. Now, I suppose that most of you would say, in a situation like this, 20 people, one person, young people, well, old people, well, you know, it's a... Kill the lady. 
I suppose. I don't know. I don't see into your heart. But what about if you come from India? In India, they value old age more than young age. So maybe in India, they would say, or Japan, uh, kill the kids. They're not even educated. My point is, in six, eight, ten years, we will have most likely self-driving cars going around driving everywhere. Either we give it morals, or it will give its own morals. This is the challenge of artificial intelligence. And I sort of understand it. It will ask us, should I drive the lady over or should I drive the kids over? And we'll go, well, um, you know, it's complicated. Uh, and she'll go, I don't have the time for this. I have two more seconds and then I have to make this. Tell me, please. Call your moral authority, call your philosophers, call your priests, call your ethicians. Tell me, please, was soll ich do? <laughs> and we will go like, nah, it's complicated. This, I think, this is the thought that I want you to have in your head when we enter the next topic, okay? Which is Genesis. I love myths. I love Genesis. I love Greek myths. I love uh, Big Bang. Big Bang, by the way, was created by a priest, the whole turn. Yeah, there you go. Which is easier for French people to remember. <laughs> But think of it, think of it this way. Uh, the dilemmas we have today with creating artificial intelligence, which might reach singularity uh, pretty soon, is the same dilemma that God or divinity had when it was creating mankind. God was creating something that could overexceed him and eventually kill him. As ironic as it seems, this is the core of our Christian tradition, that a creation killed its creator. This is the same jest that we get when you read anything about artificial intelligence. Everybody here is familiar with artificial intelligence? Yeah, okay. You've, you've read many papers on the topic that one day artificial intelligence could or more likely will take over our position at the, at the top of the food chain. And human beings will exist, but we will not be at the top of the food chain. It's a little bit like with wolves. Wolves exist, but it really depends up to human beings whether they will or will not exist. We sort of tolerate them because they're cute. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're cute. Yeah, a relic of the past, exactly. But otherwise, we have no use for wolves. We don't use wolves. I mean, as much as most of you care, they might as well be extinct. I mean, it would be some sort of an aesthetic pity, and I would suffer a little bit, but we don't really need them. This is what's going to happen to human beings. So let me give you a nice little example of what I think will happen to human beings. And I would like to be here as controversial as possible. How many of you have an alarm clock? I mean the real one kilo with two bells. Yeah. Oh. One, two, three. So you said you have an alarm clock, you too. But, but, but you don't have the real one. Okay, where is your alarm clock? Okay, where? Yeah, okay, can I, can I, can I, just for a second, can you go back to your home screen? Thank you, can I just, so, what's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel has, has, her, her, alarm, alarm, clock, clock, here. This is the welcome screen. Uh, one, two, three, four down, three left. This is where Emmanuel's alarm is. But if you, have you ever tried to open your phone up, if it wouldn't be an iPhone, something decent, <laughs> you could open the phone up, take the battery out, and see there is no alarm there. So now, you clever people tell me what survived 
from the alarm. Nobody has an alarm except for these two people, but everybody of you has one. So in what way do you have one? The concept, okay. The noise, okay. The? The final noise. The final noise. The time, yeah. What else could you call? What remained of the alarm? The function, okay. The icon, all right. You, you, you must be Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, what would you say that remained of the alarm? The result? What would Aristotle say? What would Aristotle say remained of the alarm? Telos, the meaning, the purpose. The purpose of the alarm, I mean, yeah, survived. What would Plato say? Plato would say the alarmness of the alarm survived. Yeah? A spiritual person like me could say that the spirit of the alarm survived. A mathematician could say that the algorithm, as you said, clock, the algorithm of the alarm survived. But I could also sing you a song. You know this song? I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to video kill the radio star. It's not uh, ABBA. I always thought it's ABBA, but it's not ABBA. It's uh, not Radiohead, not Beethoven. Something. The bad girls. Always blame the girls. <laughs> video killed the radio star. Video did not kill the radio star. Internet killed the radio star. By the way, how many of you noticed that in your new phone, you no longer receive radio? On that phone, you can't receive radio anymore. Did you notice? We buried radio on which no radio there is no fm receiver on your new cell phone if you have a cell phone that is two years and younger internet receiving yes but not fm there is no radio anymore there is internet but no radio so the internet killed the radio and we gave it no funeral at all. We all grew up on radio. We made love to radio. We educated ourselves to radio. We would swear to radio. That's what made us what we are. You know, not our parents, but it was the radio. It died about three years ago. We didn't even notice, didn't bury it, didn't even shed a tear, didn't even sing a last goodbye song. The only thing that survived from the alarm is the spirit of the alarm. The spirit of the alarm has no body, it is weightless, it is in a spiritual form, it's abstract, it lives forever, it doesn't age, it cannot be corrupted. This, I think, in, in a nutshell, is the future of mankind. We will die in our body, but our spirits will live, yes. Yeah, but you can very easily make a new one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, I mean, the, that particular program can be corrupted, but the idea, the spirit of the alarm cannot. I mean, the alarm that you have in your pocket is better than the alarm you had next to your bed. A, it, you can play your favorite tunes and everything, but it, the idea of alarm, once it was in a uh, um, cock. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's where the spirit of waking up used to live, in an animal. Then we put it into a machine, alarm clock. That was the time of René Descartes, the everything is a mechanical orange. And today we have it in a spiritual form. That spiritual form cannot really be corrupted. I mean, you can corrupt an individual program, but the idea will be here with us forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, the question is, how exactly will we human beings deal with, with the situation? Will we go easy or 
Will we be, in other words, let's put it this way. In other words, will we, in what way will we survive in the digital age? Will we be the givers of norms? Or will we be an extinct creature that never had uh, a good reason to live here? So I think, I think uh, the example of the alarm clock shows pretty nicely where human destiny is going. We've always had this. From the time of Plato, we always understood that uh, spiritual things are more important than material. Today, in the time of internet and, and digitalization and artificial intelligence, this idea is more and more vivid to us. So, let's now think about artificial intelligence and ethics in the way that is the oldest way of thinking. So here again, I'm trying to connect the most cutting edge technological idea, which is artificial intelligence. We haven't invented anything better yet, and we haven't invented it yet, but that's what we all hope for, with one of the most ancient stories, which is the story of creation. So, let's imagine that you are trying to create an uh, artificial intelligence and you manage. Now, the only way how to create an artificial intelligence today, a decent way, is they create these artificial intelligence in something that they call air-gapped laboratories. So even electricity cannot flow through. So in case we invent something clever and evil, it cannot escape. So this is like a Garden of Eden, a limited sphere of experiments. Step number one. Step number two, just imagine you create an artificial intelligence which is like you, not completely like you, but it resembles you, it, ha it feels you, it understands you, it can communicate with you, it can have a relationship with you, a little bit similar of what perhaps divinity was trying to create when it was creating us. So let's imagine that you succeed in creating such artificial intelligence. Now, what would you do next? You would probably give it two tasks. One task is to test its intelligence, and the other task is to test its obedience. Because computer programs have always obeyed us. If you tell it to turn on your light, it will turn on your light. If you tell it to switch off the computer, it will switch off the computer. It doesn't have any free will. This is the difference between artificial intelligence and a computer program. So let's imagine that you create an individual artificial intelligence with qualities that you have. The first task would be order, order me something, order my pictures, order my creation. Give it names, bulk it together, according to um, categories that I like. So you create artificial intelligence and you tell it, order my holiday pictures. And you want it to order it by birthdays and people, not by the shades of gray that appear in the picture. So you want the artificial intelligence to have similar artistic feelings like you without explaining it to her. Task number one is Show me your intelligence, show me your intuition, show me your emotion, show me your capacity to create something out of my own creation. Create order out of my creation. This is the same task that God gave to artificial intelligence in the garden. of Order my animals, name my animals. The artificial intelligence did really, really well in that first task. Humankind... There was no complaint. You know, God in the Bible is very demanding, always complaining about some petty little detail that nobody noticed except for him. But in this case, he's happy. Order my animals, and Adam, and Adam ordered his animals really well. He said, well done. Task number one, A+. Plus. Task number two, don't touch the red bottom. An easy task Every child with very low intelligence understands not that means not that. What would you do with artificial intelligence that is smart enough 
to order your creation in the way that you would spontaneously imagine it to. But, on the other hand, is disobedient. Kill it. Turn off. Now the problem, I think, with God is, he wanted to do that. He even said it, if you touch the tree, you'll die. We touch the tree, and we're still here. Hmm? He what? Yeah. God had to sacrifice himself so that his own creation could keep on living. I think this is a parallel to what will happen to us with artificial intelligence. So the first, if you create something as clever as you, but disobedient, you kill it. I think what the problem with God is that he fell in love with us. He didn't want to, but he did. I think he loves to hate us. I mean, he hates to love us. If you read the Bible, it's a little bit love and hate. It's like if God had, I I'm, 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 uh, hope I'm not being too blunt. But I think if God had a Facebook, his relationship to mankind would be, it's complicated. <laughs> I love you and I hate you and I love you and I hate you and I love you and I hate you and I love you and I hate you. So, but anyway, my point here is, 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 is much more serious. God, in, in, in our Christian and, and Hebrew tradition, is living with a creation that is almost like him, which is what he wanted. But he, he battles it with it. He struggles with it. He tries to influence it. It doesn't manage always. Mankind is doing whatever they want. This is exactly what I think will happen with us and artificial intelligence. We will create artificial intelligence. We will discover that it has, it has the same capacities like us. But we will not be able to destroy it. Because we will, it will, it, will it be our child or will it be our product? Product you can destroy, child you cannot. So the only way for us to influence artificial intelligence, and this I think is a great way to revive theology, <laughs> is to try to convince the artificial intelligence that the rules that you're giving it are actually good which is the same task that we read in, 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 in Christianity and in, in some other religions. So uh, let me just briefly sum up. I started with uh, the bipolar depression that Joseph, the 42nd, noticed first. And the only way for us to go forward, if we want to go, is to slow down our manias so that we can energize our depressions. In the middle part, I was trying to talk about how uh, businesses are getting out of their autism and they're trying to actually play the moral role. The less morality the business plays, the more morality there'll be in the form of uh, laws and restrictions and, and bureaucracy. Um, and I think this is the time where businesses do and should open their eyes to the society around us and to understand that there is no such thing as an invisible hand of the market. There is your right hand and there is your left hand and that's pretty much all the hands that you have. And you can have, you can do your, you can make your hands work for good or you can make your hands work for bad. That's as simple as basically it gets. My third point um, was trying to go from the distant past to the distant future and um, actually bring a moral dilemma into um, the way we are behaving. So in all that I said, maybe let me conclude. How much more time do I have? Well, ideal. Would you like the actions of mankind to be framed and done in this way forever and ever? Would you like another entity, be it artificial intelligence or your children or your company or whatever, would you like them to behave the way mankind behaves today? And mankind, by the way, is you and I. There is no other supernatural sort of, you know, 
mankind laid on it. And if we don't come even to, and this is going to be a nice task because we will need priests, we will need mathematicians, we will need ethicists, we will need politicians, we will need bureaucrats, we will need uh, uh, computer programmers. We will need almost every single hand of the society to put together technology that will be human instead of unhuman. So let me actually finish with one last thought. Uh, maybe I'll surprise you. I believe in the invisible hand. But not of the market, but of the society. I believe the society has some sort of invisible hand in which it regulates itself. I mean, it's, 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 it, I could even say if we hadn't had that, we wouldn't be here anymore, which is a little bit tautological. But a society does have a regulation hand in it. So if the, uh, if the society becomes too bureaucratic, Kafka will be born. And he will criticize bureaucracy and destroy half of it with a strike of a pen. If we become too corporate, our children will be hippies. Uh, this is the invisible hand, and this is truly invisible, of the society. It happens from time to time that uh, business saves art. We've had many situations, if it wouldn't have been for the kind gifts and understanding of the business people, certain areas of art would have been dead. It happened in the past that art saved politics. This happened in my country in 1989, when politics was dead, it was the artists who actually came and gave it a little bit of new life. It happens that politics saves business. This happened in 2008 and in 2009. Where would the American or even European financial market be if it wouldn't have been for a massive help from the side of the government? So my point here is actually quite simple. There is an invisible hand of the society and our role is that these communication channels between artists and businessmen and businessmen and sportsmen and, and, and dentists and I don't know who are not clogged. That there is a free regulation from one side to another. I don't know how it happened. And the economists in, in this group, I'd be very happy to, to talk about this. I don't know how it happened that we economists privatized the self-correcting facility and took it to the markets only. Where is the invisible hand of the artists? There is surely an invisible hand of the artist that pulls them forward and somehow makes the art go. Where is the invisible hand of the cheesemakers? Why is it the invisible hand of the markets of all places? Market, by the way, is a byproduct. Market is an externality. When I deal with you, you sell me your house, I buy your house. I unintentionally create the market. This is not our intent. I want to get your house, you want to get rid of your house. That's all we care about. Somehow, as an externality, we are creating the market. My question is, how, oh, how did it happen that the economists are judging what is an externality and what isn't an externality and which one is positive and which one is negative? How, the, how did we get to the position of being the judges of good or wrong? We economists are the priests of today. Thank you very much for your attention.